Well, that's another Monday. I wanted to give you guys some more photos and comments. I got some little video clips on this one too, so you may enjoy hanging around for a little longer than you might usually. Uh, and at the end, I've got some examples of the electrical systems finals that I used to uh, give my students. I morphed over the years. I learned over the years I was teaching to put the electrical final in, a, in five or six parts instead of just letting them do one simple task. But anyway, let's move on with what we've got here. I put this airbag out there. It was the passenger side airbag from a Cadillac. And at the time I had a little keyless entry set up in that black box you saw so that we could actually hook up the um, airbag you know, defeat the little shorting bar between the pins on the connector and wire this thing up so that when somebody could be use a uh, remote uh, fob to light off the airbag because they didn't need anybody to be close to it because those things can kill you if they go the wrong way. And that one there, you might notice it, it jumped up completely out of sight of the camera uh, with it and it sounded like a shotgun and furthermore it shook the camera. Uh, you might notice that. Now you can back up and look at that again. <clears throat> Here's another Three, one. Three, two, one. How do you like that? How would you like to be sitting there? Look at all the smoke. That would fill the car up with smoke and choke you out, wouldn't it? Would that be bad news or what? Notice it broke the windshield and it went all the way back to the seat and it would, if the other windows didn't break in the crash, it filled the car completely up with smoke. Now that was just the passenger side airbag, uh, which is bigger than the driver's side, but all that smoke, it seems to me like they should be able to make an airbag that didn't fill up. Now the newer airbags might not do this. This was on a like a 94 model Lexus that we were getting ready to scrap, uh, but I just wanted everybody to see that. Now this is Edison's electric car. He's got these batteries in there. Uh, 1913. You can look that up and look at the specs on that car, how fast it would go, how long it would go on a charge and all that kind of stuff. I didn't see any point in putting all that in here. <clears throat> but I did find this in an old magazine that my wife had. I've not seen this picture anywhere else on the internet at all unless I posted it there. This beating this horse, this Buick defeating this horse would never have happened with an electric vehicle ever back in these days. Now, nowadays, obviously, an electric vehicle uh, for short distances works, you know, as good as a gas burner, and they say, oh, it'll outrun it and all that kind of stuff. But uh, all you want to do to outdo an electric vehicle is, uh, like, especially if it's a pickup truck, is put a 10,000 pound trailer behind it and take off and see how who has to stop first. You know, if you have to stop first for fuel and if they have to stop first for a charge. Um, but the little caption down here that you may not be able to read says, This is the day everything changed. The horse was more than sleek flanks, flaring nostrils, and sinewy beauty. It represented a way of life. It was the status quo. Ah, but the car. It was simply a machine trying to shoulder its way into a lifestyle that was still not completely at ease with machines. There had to be a confrontation. The machine had to be put in its place. And so in some unremembered pasture on some unremembered day, the people lined up to watch some unremembered horse defend their way of life. What they saw was history. It didn't matter that the car had won. The mere fact that there was a victory. The automobile had arrived and the technology and tempo of an entire country, indeed the entire world, had changed forever. That was a very, very cool picture. And I went looking for it online. I could not find this thing anywhere else. But I found it in an old magazine. And it was a Buick car ad. Uh, that they put, it was a double full page ad and it was in one of the magazines my wife had from way back in the 70s. Uh, but I don't know, this is just amazing to me to look at that picture and all the details in it. Now, I got this B2300 uh, when I go to get food in the morning. <laughs> uh, I first noticed this thing and then a couple of days I noticed it was parked the other way, still had the same flat tire. And then the next week it was parked in the opposite direction again with a flat tire. You know, you expect to see a vehicle like this sitting in the same parking place for weeks. This one here, apparently somebody comes and airs the tire up, drives it around, and comes back and parks it. Then they have to leave it again because it's always early in the morning when I go over there. And that's the only car in the parking lot. 
Um, well, this is a very strange situation. <laughs> Somebody doesn't get that flat fixed. The local uh, road mark up here, uh, tire shop, will fix a flat for free. I mean, uh, so there are several tire shops around here that if you take your car over there and it's got a nail in the tire or a flat, if, unless it needs a tire, obviously, if they, can, if they can patch it or fix it, they'll fix it for free of charge. Uh, I took my pickup up there with a screw in the tire, or no, not my pickup, my Explorer, and I could hear that screw going bop, 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 bop on the pavement like you do. And I took it up there and uh, I went ahead and had them replace a uh, bad uh, tire pressure monitor sensor that was flashing the light and saying it had a tire sensor fault, uh, which they did charge for that, and I don't begrudge them that, but they charged not a penny for fixing that flat. <clears throat> and that's not the first time I've had them fix a flat and not charge me for it. And that's really cool. That's how you get customers though. Now this is a slow brake job. I don't hold this against my neighbor at all, and I'm not making fun of him. I know he's got a job where he works long, long hours, and he's usually he looks when he gets home he looks to me like he's really exhausted. Um, but this is not the first time I've actually posted another vehicle uh, that he had done a brake job on, and it took usually takes him about three weeks to a month to do a brake job. Now he knows what he's doing, and, and the vehicle stops whenever he uh, does that, but. You know, when I was working, when I was, uh, well, when I was working at the, uh, in shops and in the dealership and all, we had to do brake jobs really fast. Um, I did the front brakes on a 67 Ford pickup I was driving. Uh, the boss man says, I says, can I do the front brakes on my truck? He said, if you can do it the last 45 minutes of the day, um, but you can't do it during, you know, before then. And so uh, I threw that thing on the lift and I pulled those drums off and I pulled the shoes off and I, I resurfaced the drums, and this was in 1977, I resurfaced the drums, I rebuilt the wheel cylinders, I put all the brand new brake shoes on it, and uh, you know, I started out at 440, I mean 415, and I backed that vehicle out of the shop at, uh, before 5 o'clock, you know, I, I bled the brakes and everything and all that, and so, uh, granted it was an older vehicle, but drum brakes are no picnic, uh, disc brakes are typically easier. Uh, but <clears throat> what was crazy about that, you know, if you get one little grain of dirt in those wheel cylinders, they're going to blow a wheel cylinder and your brakes are going to fall to the floor. And that night I was riding that truck in town and this girl that was with me, she says, hey, speed up and catch these people up here. I think I know who that is. And so uh, the vehicle in front of me was a station wagon and it was acting like it was going to go through the yellow light. And so I hammered down and picked up some speed and I was, you know, seven or eight car lengths behind it. And then the station wagon chickens out and stops without warning uh, when they looked like they were going to go ahead. And I locked the brakes up on that truck and I was thinking the whole time I was sliding that 100 feet or whatever it was that I had really been in a hurry when I rebuilt those front brakes, but they held. Anyway, it, it usually takes about 30 minutes to an hour, even if you're slow, to replace brake pads and rotors on most vehicles. Uh, but this guy right here, bless his heart, he just, he works really hard all the time and I think he just, he does it as he can and as he feels like it or something. But, uh, but like I say, when he's done, the brakes work, but it takes him a long time to do a brake job. Now these cabin air filters are interesting. You know, uh, some of your Teslas have got huge cabin, uh, huge air filters underneath the front when you open it up, there's a there's an air filter in there that's gigantic. It's like two by two by three feet or something. And then they'll have another cabin air filter under there, under the. Uh, but not every vehicle has a cabin air filter. None of the vehicles me and my wife have cabin air filters. Not a single one. We have two Ford pickups and then my, my Explorer, and we don't have any cabin air filters. Chevy pickups will have a cabin air filter or in Chevy vans and stuff like that. Usually it's behind the dash, easy to get to. Some of your Nissan Altimas. So we'll have the thing right in the middle above, I mean right in the center of the bulkhead. And it's really odd because the filter uh, is going to be as big as this one. But it actually accordions together and comes out a hole that's only about half as big as the filter. And then when you get another Nissan filter to replace it, you accordion in there, stick it in there and it pops back out. Um, but the parts store will sell you two small filters where you stick one of them in, it drops down, you stick the other one in, it sits on top of it. Um, but this one here was kind of funny. One of my guys pulled it out and it had a uh, all that, you know, 
whatever that is. It looks like catfish feed or something. I don't know what in the world that's. But it got in there somehow. I guess somebody threw it on the car and it got down by the <laughs> thing. Now this is, I want to talk a little bit about diesel injector lines. What some people may not realize is whenever you've got a high pressure pump that's sending pulses of fuel to pop those injectors, every one of these lines has got to be exactly the same length as every other line. You cannot have a line, you know, before they bend these, they have to be exactly the same length as all the other lines. Uh, I had a diesel forklift I worked on one time, or a tractor or something, I can't remember what it was, this is 50 years ago, and it was misfiring on one cylinder, and that cylinder also happened to have a line going from the injector pump to the injector that somebody had built uh, just out of tubing and, you know, put the ends on it and all that kind of stuff. And it was a different length from the other lines. Now, the timing of that uh, injector pop is directly tied to how fast that fuel pressure gets there. And if that, if that injector is going to fire out of time, if that line is any longer or any shorter than any of the other lines, furthermore, the radius cannot be tighter than a certain bend on that. And I don't remember what the radius is. I think it's it's got to be no tighter than one and a half inches or something like that. Uh, is the tightest bend you can have. You can have a bigger one, but you cannot have a tighter bend than that because that'll slow the fuel down going through that thing on its way to the injector. Um, I saw that and I just wanted to mention that. Uh, that's one of those little things that you learn. They also put these really heavy duty clamps on these things to keep them from wiggling around when that high pressure is shooting through them because the pressure will be from 1800 to 2800 pounds or something like that depending on which diesel you got. Now that second rate belt tensioner we had just installed that and um, you know I'm not hating on Deco because a lot of the stuff Deco makes is pretty good but there was a time when Deco made some of the sorriest belt tensioners ever um, once back in uh, when I was driving a 95 Taurus I went out there one Saturday morning to go somewhere and the brake the belt tensioner just popped I mean it broke and all of a sudden I had no you know, no belt doing anything except just flopping around under there and so I had to get on my pickup truck and go to the parts store. So I get on my pickup, I go to the parts store, I say, I need to see about getting a belt tensioner. So the advanced auto parts guy throws a Deco belt tensioner on the counter and it's like $80. And I said, that's pretty doggone pricey for a belt tensioner, but I'll take it because i got to have it. And so I, I took it and put it on my Taurus and got the belt put back on it. And that seemed like okay. So I went to the parts store, Ford place, I'm sorry. And I talked to the parts guy who was a friend of mine. I said, if I walked in here and you didn't know me and didn't even like me and didn't even know who I was, what would you charge me for a belt tensioner for my 95 Taurus 3 liter? And he said, $55. Now, this is, I granted this was years ago. I don't know what they cost now. But I said, print me an estimate on that. So he did. And I went back to the parts store and I says, look, the Ford place sells these for $55. And I showed him the receipt. I says, you charged me this for this belt tensioner here. Uh, 80 bucks so you're supposed to price match so what's the deal on this could you price match this and give me a refund he says no they're selling them for what I for less than what I pay for mine so I can't price match that and I said well why don't you buy them from the Ford place and sell them and mark them up I guarantee you the Ford place would sell them to you at a discount and you could sell them cheaper than 80 bucks and probably be selling a better tensioner well, that story's not over. Uh, not long after that, I got a different vehicle, and I sold that vehicle to my son, and he was working at a tire store. And uh, he was noticing the belt had started squealing on the Taurus that I had put that belt tensioner on. And he looked down there. Um, he told me, he says, Dad, I've sprayed uh, silicone on the belt because it was squealing, and as soon as I spray silicone on it, the belt jumps off. <laughs> and I went over, I looked, and I said, Look, that belt tensioner's out of line. I mean, it was just like the one you saw in the video. 
and it was the same brand as the one that was in the video. I've seen that over and over and over and over. If we use one of those belt tensioners, whether it's on an Oldsmobile, an Alto, a Ford, I mean, a Nissan or a Ford or whatever, that thing's going to get out of line. Or not now. I don't know if they're like that now. But there was a time they went through a spell of making belts that were really noisy, that were shiny with flutes on them, and they would make a noise that make you sound like you had a bad bearing or something. And they also made those belt tensioners that get out of line. Like I say, I'm not saying anything negative about Deco as a company, but I do know that I personally experienced some problems with their products. Uh, not all their products, just some of their belts and the tensioners that I used. I got to the point where I wanted a Gates tensioner. Where some people say they've had trouble with Gates tensioners, but if you lay a Gates tensioner next to the OEM, it looks exactly like it. And the, the Deco doesn't. It's got a different look about it. Anyway, belt tensioners, there's more to a belt tensioner than you think. Uh, so you just got to be really careful who's you buy. And, and, you know, like I say, cheaper is not necessarily worse, and the dealer is not always more expensive. That was another lesson I learned from all that. When you see a tensioner that moves that easy, then you have got issues. It's going to make it rattle. Now this guy right here was a student of mine, and he was driving his Honda Passport, and it was making his rattling noise. And when we went investigating it, that belt tensioner uh, is supposed to be really, really, really tight to the point to work. And a new one, uh, this tensioner here, you have to squeeze it with a vise, and you had to put a pin through that hole and that hole to hold it, and bolt it back on, you put your timing belt on, and when you get your timing belt all put on there, you pull that pin, it's got to be a drill bit or something, it can't be a paper clip, it's got, it's, it's, that is a really, really strong tensioner. Well, when this thing here, kind of like the, the uh, hydraulic hood springs, you know, how they lose their ability to, to spring and they'll fall on your head and all that stuff, um, this thing... <laughs> <laughs> had died like that. And another funny thing about this student was he had bought this vehicle for $1,500 from his grandfather. And he says uh, his grandfather told him that a Honda is the only kind of vehicle anybody ought to ever own because that's the only real car anybody in the world makes. Uh, his grandfather was so totally sold on Hondas. And, it, and I says, well, and I, like I say, I'm not hating on Hondas either because, I mean, I've, Honda's got some good ideas about a lot of stuff. Um, they they're, They don't take marching orders from anybody else or copy anybody else's stuff and a lot of their ideas are really really good um, but uh, and I could talk about their gasoline direct injection that kind of stuff but long and short of it is uh, they have better ideas on GDI than some of the other automakers do by far about the way that the low pressure side of the fuel system works but what I was getting at was I told him I says well let's just check and see what we can find online about Hondas and I went in there just at random sat down at my desk and I said, uh, I typed in, I said, you know, people with, that have had problems with Hondas, and this website popped up, I don't even know if it's still online now, but this was like 15 years ago, and he's, or maybe 10, he says, he said, hondasucks.com, <laughs> and there was line after line after line after line of people who said they'd never own another Honda, but the thing about it is, it doesn't matter what make of vehicle you get, as long as it's not something like a Yugo, um, you're basically going to find some people that really love that, some people that are neutral about it, and some people that hate it to the point they'll never own another one. That's just the way that that works. That's just the way people are. Uh, so you can't really say if you buy this brand of vehicle, you won't have any problems. You cannot say that. You can also not say if you buy an Asian or a German car or even an American car. You can't say if you don't want to have any trouble, buy a Toyota or a Nissan or a, you know, whatever and all that. I like Toyotas. I really got no problem with Nissans. If I was going to go Asian, though, I would probably go Toyota first and then down from there. Uh, Hyundai and Kia is pretty good, but and they're, you know, they're growing and they make their cars look sexier with them funky lights on the front of them and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but... A lot of these younger engineers are, uh, are trying to change everything really, really fast, and they're finding out. Uh, well, the Vega engine, uh, back in the Vega was probably one of the sorriest vehicles GM ever built because of that crappy engine they had. Well, they spent years in producing that engine in the laboratory, and they just absolutely knew that was going to be probably the best engine they ever made. But when it got out there in the field, the thing just started turning out to be a piece of junk, and everybody that's 
as old as I am or remember Chevrolet Vegas, you know, they were a beautiful little car, but the engine was sorry. Time and belt with the round teeth, like that one there. Some of them have square teeth, some have round teeth. The this, this round tooth time and belt seem to be worse about this. But if you tighten it too tight, it'll make noises like you just heard there. I've talked about this a little bit before on this channel. Uh, the square belt, the square tooth belt, isn't as bad to make noise as the round tooth belt for some reason. I can't explain that. I don't know if it's wind or what it is that's causing that. I've just seen it too many times. I've put timing belts on myself, over tightened them, the round toothed ones, <clears throat> and I've seen I've had them make noise like that. And I knew immediately I had to go back and loosen the belt. Uh, the escorts back in the uh, 80s used to have develop a random misfire, but the distributor was on the opposite end of the camshaft. And initially, when that random misfire, we would replace the distributor, and it would seem to fix it for a little bit, and then come back. And I ultimately found out on those the timing belt had worked, had become too loose. And if you tightened the timing belt just a little bit, that random misfire on those escorts would go away. You know, a lot of the times there's these interacting systems will confuse people. Now these are your relays. This is Ford, which is like a Bosch relay. See, Ford and the Bosch are very similar. It's a Bosch relay. But the terminals and the configuration is numbered. Now I'm not even talking about the potted relays. Uh, that you know I've mentioned on here before. Now, these right here are all mechanical relays I'm showing you here. The, the potted relays will look like this, but they'll actually have potting here and they have got something different on the inside. Um, but you might notice pins are one, four, two, three, and five. And if you look at that, three is the common terminal. And then see, one and two are your call. So this was the call. And these two are typically going to be the load carrying terminal. This one here will be the one that's hot all the time. And whenever the relay is not energized, whatever's coming in here will be coming out four. But when you energize, you know, you know ground one and ground two and power one or vice versa, uh, the power that's coming in here suddenly jumps and starts coming out here. Now, the other relays are named with the are numbered with these ISO numbers. 30 would be your common. See that? 30 is your common. 87, and this is a slightly different relay than that because it's got five terminals. See, this terminal here has been removed and it's not on the schematic. <clears throat> this is a GM relay. The, gem, the genius about this GM relay, if it's a four pin, is you can plug it in either way. It doesn't matter which way you plug it in because it works either way. Because, excuse me, the 85 and 86 are the call. See there? And they're catty cornered across from one another. 87 and 30 are your common terminal and the one that's normally open. So when you energize 85 and 86, whatever's in 30 is going to come out 87. On Ford's the same thing. This is your common terminal. These three right here that are all facing the same way on this standard ISO relay are all start with a C. Coil, I mean coil, coil, and common. And this one right here is your normally open. So when you energize this one and this one, whatever's coming in here jumps out there. Uh, when it's not energized, whatever's just coming in here is coming out of that middle terminal, see? But you notice 87A and 87A, those are the both the normally closed terminals. And then your other GM relay is like this one, except it's a bigger relay. And this one is actually numbered, you know, 30, uh, 85, 86, and 87. Uh, now, I may have these, I don't know, I believe 30 and 87 may be transposed on this, but it doesn't matter because it works either way. And furthermore, the relays are not polarity sensitive where the coils are concerned. They don't, that's why they don't have a clamping diode, because if they did, you would burn something up when you plugged one in backwards, or if it was wired up backwards. So uh, the little, see this little, on the schematic right here, uh, they they show this little uh, clamping diode. This one here shows it, but you can't see it. That's not a clamping diode, I'm sorry, it's a clamping resistor. So that when that relay coil de-energizes, it doesn't create a spike it's going to damage whatever controller uh, is doing because when that magnetic field collapses across those windings, it creates a high voltage spark, like kind of like an ignition coil, although not quite as hot. But you don't want that spike going back, so you put a resistor in there and let it chase its tail. 
and that's pretty well how that works. What does this transmission filter fit? And this is a transmission filter, believe it or not. Isn't that an interesting thing? This is where the fluid goes in, it goes through the filter, and then it goes up into the transmission. All right, this is what it fits. This 71 Cadillac El Dorado that belonged to the president of the college. Look how long that hood is. Man, I think it was like a football field. And there's Bobby backing it out of the shop. I had to stop him, let me take that picture. This is a bunch of my trainer cars out there behind that. That was a trainer vehicle I had. That Ranger was. That White Crown Victoria was. There's the Lexus we lit off the airbag on. This Pontiac was given to me with 250,000 miles on it. The lady said she thought it had a blown head gasket. And while the trim and the insides of the thing looked kind of crummy, the engine on that thing ran like a sewing machine at 250,000 miles. Uh, that's why I was telling you, you know, a lot of this is an American car and it gets lots of miles on it. I knew people that drove Jeeps, uh, Cherokees that would put 400,000 miles on them, keep that Jeep, buy another one just like it, you know. And this old Escort over here is the one that I bought for $400 from the parts man because he wasn't going to use it for parts delivery anymore. It had a manual transmission and I taught my students how to drive a manual transmission using that ratty old thing. I don't know how many clutches we had to put in it. But uh, anyway, that's a little history there. Now return versus returnless fuel systems. Uh, the fuel that comes out of the pump goes through here into the excuse me, I'm sorry, I did this through this backward. I was a dum-dum. It goes through here and it goes to the injectors and then the pressure raises this spring so that this seat opens up and the fuel that's above 40 PSI goes back to the tank. Right? Now that works okay. On a diesel that's got return fuel they have to run this return underneath the fuel so it doesn't get oxidized and make tar in the fuel tank. And it will do that. Uh, Volkswagen misfired on that on some of their vehicles because they would just have the fuel spraying back into the tank above there. And all that oxygen that was in the air, what little oxygen in it, would react with that fuel spray coming back through the return and it would make tar. And it would clog things up. But uh, Ford Power Strokes had that thing going all the way down and they had it going a little duck bill way at the bottom of the tank so it never saw any oxygen on the return side. Now the return list you notice has got a filter, I mean it's got a, a uh, regulator usually and Honda does this even on the ones that feed GDF high pressure fuel pumps. Uh, it regulates the fuel pressure. Cadillac does this even in the late 2000s. They have a, a regulator right there on the fuel pump in the tank and they've only got this one. Chrysler was doing this in the mid-90s, um, and that was uh, the, the crazy thing about the Chrysler stuff is uh, I worked on a Dodge that had a misfire on cylinder number one. It drove me crazy until I realized the fuel pump was cavitating, and the engine was sitting in there at a slight angle with the front up, and the highest part of that fuel rail was where the number one injector was, and there were bubbles coming out of the fuel tank going to the top of that rail. It was not a returnless system. I mean, it wasn't a return system. So that air couldn't go anywhere, and you always had air instead of fuel at that number one injector, and it was causing it to misfire on number one. I thought I was going to go wacky trying to figure that one out, but finally I did. Don't remember exactly how I landed on that, but the fuel pump was the problem making it misfire on cylinder number one because it had a returnless fuel system and the way it was. Now I had another one. I had a, a, a Lincoln Town Car mid 90s with a 4.6, and it was sitting level, and that had a cavitating fuel pump creating air bubbles and that one there because of the fact that it was sitting perfectly level had a, a funky uh, idle and I was checking it for that and when I hooked the SBDS machine up it had a walking skip that would walk through the fire in order one three seven two six five four eight and then it would start over and I called the hotline it stumped them they had no idea what to do <clears throat> but it turned out when I looked at the gauge it was bouncing and I said well that means there's air in the fuel and so I put a fuel pump on that one and took care of that rough idle problem. That car only had 15,000 miles on it and it had been bought and then traded in because the person that bought it first didn't like that rough idle and the Lincoln Mercury place at the time couldn't figure out what was wrong with it. Uh, our dispatcher bought it. He had me look at it and I finally figured it out. Now if you're pumping your... Anybody that's ever bled brakes and forgot to make sure the master cylinder had plenty of fuel in it... Uh, fuel, I'm sorry, brake fluid in it... Uh, <laughs> would run that thing out of brake fluid and then you've pumped your system full of air and you got to start all over. Well what I would do, thinking about chicken house waterers, 
and I would get a bottle, clean it up, wash it out with brake sparks cleaner, clean it up and everything really good where they would put brake fluid in it, dump it out a couple of times, then I'd fill it up with brake fluid and I would stand it in the master cylinder like you see right here. That's a perfect thing because it's not going to, the fuel, I mean the fuel, good grief, the brake fluid is going to only gurgle out of there whenever it gets below the mouth of the bottle and you'll see bubbles coming up in here. Furthermore, you have extra fluid capacity. You have a sight glass here, so you can actually see how much brake fluid you have left at a glance, usually from inside the car, unless the hood's got you blocked. Uh, but that is the smartest way to do that. And, uh, you know, you just got to fill that thing up and, you know, hold your finger over it and turn it up in the uh, master shoulder. You can actually, you know, flush your brakes like that too by opening all the bleeders and just making sure you keep fluid in there. And that's one of the best ways I ever found. I don't know who else, I don't think anybody else has ever done that. If they did, um, I didn't copy anybody. I just came up with this idea myself. You gotta think outside the box if you wanna do stuff that works for good. Now this 88302 Bronco had a low idle vacuum and black smoke. And initially they thought maybe a bad leaking intake gasket or something like that. Um, and this was a map sensor vehicle, so it was reading vacuum to determine engine load, and it had a low idle vacuum, like 12 inches, and it was puffing black smoke. It ran pretty decent above idle, <coughs> but when that thing was idling, it was terrible. Well, I told uh, my buddy Donnie was working on this, and I said, there's two things, usually, that cause it to have low engine vacuum idling. One of them is late ignition timing. He said, well, I've already checked that. Of course, he didn't really know if the balancer might have slipped, but the balancer was new, so probably didn't. Secondly, I says, late valve timing. He said, well, I don't know about that. And I said, well, you don't really have any good way to check it, but late valve timing. Also, something else that will have, make you have low intake vacuum whenever it's idling is if EGR is flowing, but that will typically also make it idle rough. And EGR is not supposed to flow at idle, except on the diesels. And if you open the EGR on a diesel, it makes it run really quiet, <laughs> which is interesting in and of itself. This is what happened. The person that put this balancer on, he put a new balancer on. This is not a picture of that balancer, but it's one like it. Didn't tighten this bolt enough. He probably just tightened it with a ratchet and a socket until he got tired, and then he stopped. Well, this is supposed to pinch against that gear so that this key is not carrying the entire load of pulling the camshaft. And so what happened there was, you know, this thing turns in this direction, right? Okay, so what happened was the uh, crankshaft actually sheared the key, left the keyway behind and started to move. And it got this much out of time. The valve timing was this much. And this was a roller chain too, you might notice. So anyway, uh, the fact that somebody didn't tighten this up enough to pinch that gear, uh, this right here is just to locate the gear. It's not to carry the load of the whole timing chain. When he got the thing back in time, I don't remember. There may have been an issue with having to, they may have had to replace the crankshaft. I don't remember that. I do know they had to replace that, that gear. But anyway, long and the short of it was, that was the root of the problem. And whatever has to be done, has to be done in there. Exactly. Here's a cool Mustang let, turn. Hey, let Alan three. see that. See there? Mm hmm That's cool. He's got it. That was a kit. My buddy Donnie, that's at his shop. And this guy, originally, he wanted uh, an engine rebuild. He bought an engine that was used. And he says, I got an engine uh, for this thing that I, I bought that uh, was running whenever it was taken out of the vehicle. And uh, he said, I'll bring it to you. He said, I'm going to clean it up some first. And so a couple of, you know, about a month went by before the guy brought the engine. And when he did, it was locked up. And Donnie looked up in there, the whole inside of the engine and all was all rusty. And he said, what did you do to clean this thing up? What did you mean? He said, well, I took the pan off and I sprayed a bunch of Dawn dishwasher liquid in there and I washed it out with a hose. <laughs> this was a bad idea. <laughs> anyway, they had to do massive amounts of work to get that thing straightened out. <laughs> anyway, he built the engine, put it in there, and they re he restored the Mustang, his beautiful car, and he's got these fancy lights on the end of it. That's a little funny story there. Now, this one here, this is what happens when somebody keeps trying to run the air conditioner when it's locked up. You know, they don't pay any attention to the noise. They just turn it on, they let it run, and uh, it'll make some smoke. 
Now this is a test board I built for part of my electrical one exam. And what I would do is I'd either put a bad relay there or I would push one of these bug switches which they weren't allowed to touch and you couldn't tell if it was pressed. And uh, they would have to they push this button, this fan would not run, and they'd have to find out why. Now I had another relay that looked exactly like, I had two relays that looked, looked exactly like, one of them was doctored, uh, and also these would break various different circuits. And so the power, the power was connected here to that bolt, and the ground was connected there, see. And so that's how you would get power into this thing. And it would light up, well, actually put power here and ground here. It would light up the LED over here. And so I say, if you ask for a relay and you get that up, if you plug a relay in, then the relay don't fix it, you're done, and you, you fail the exam. But if you guess, then you, you know, what I wanted them to do was pull the relay, and I wanted them to check for, you know, and operate the switch. And I wanted them to check these terminals with a little cheap test light I had. It had it with an LED test light. And I said, you're looking for two powers and two grounds. When you've got that switch depressed and you know, relay removed, you should have two powers and two grounds. If you don't have two powers, you, you have a power coming in on your common, right? And you've got a power coming in on one side of your coil. And when you're mashing the switch, you're going to have a ground here and you're going to have a ground coming back through your load. So that t you can really quick isolate if you pull it out and know what you're checking and know which terminal switch, you can find out what's wrong there. This is another worksheet I had. It was part of my electrical final where they had to build this circuit and do all of these things. And that would take them through everything a meter was supposed to do. And that would tell me if they knew how to use a meter or not. This was my final exam. I would also tell them I had a, that fan board that I've showed you on here before and I'd have them wire that up using this schematic to wire it up and make it work like it was supposed to. And that's like a General Motors cooling fan circuit. Um, well, I accidentally put that on here twice. Uh, this one here, I would uh, have them do a starter voltage drop test. And then I would circle whether it was right or wrong. And I would have them identify the test points, positive and negative, on the vehicle sign for doing a starter voltage drop test. Then I, they would perform it. And on the positive and the negative sides, I'd watch them do that. And I'd have them set the meter to measure amps. And how many amps can this meter safely measure? They had to write that down using a power source, the meter jumper wires, and the load device provided by the instructor to demonstrate the procedure for using the meter to measure amps. And that would be a 20 point thing. But the long and short, then they had to use the E uh, equal, uh, you know, Ohm's law basically to calculate how many ohms the load had when it was energized, which is going to be different if it's a light bulb, different, ener different resistance energized than it is when it's not. This is one where I would put a bug in the charging system on that little Ford Ranger. Now, I even had a schematic, and I had all these little words down here. So they could look at all this stuff, and they could go through that and try to figure out what was wrong with the charging system. And the guys that would gather up with a couple of other guys all semester long and just fill out their worksheets while watching those other guys could never pass a final exam, a hands-on final exam. It would, this one guy was standing there 30 minutes after I gave him the paper looking at it because he didn't know what to do because he had never done the work during the semester. Another guy never wanted to do a, a strut. He never wanted to pull a strut off. And so when he had to pull a strut off the following semester, when he refused to ever do it, you know, it was one of the worksheets he wouldn't do. Um, he didn't know how to pull a strut off and he was working on a PT Cruiser and he sp spun the nut off in the middle of the strut, and the strut underneath there went and popped off, and he had it all laying up in pieces on the workbench and all. And, it, and another guy wouldn't do ball joints because he just thought it was too much trouble. And so the first time he went to work in the field, the first ticket they handed him was ball joints on a, on a pickup truck. And he absolutely had nowhere to start because he wouldn't do the worksheets. You know, you try to work him through all those tasks, and somebody can uh, know how to play the game, get past all those, you know, task sheets by watching other people or working with other people or they'd be I'm helping him this kind of thing get in trouble that way well this is the final slide and I really appreciate you guys coming around and I appreciate you listening to my videos and I hope that you'll have a good week and hey let's be careful out there and I'll see you next time